Good to see you here this evening. Look forward to our time of worship together. Let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 263. Certainly a, an appropriate hymn of all of the storms of life and everything we hear in the news, things going on. So what a blessing to have. Christ is our rock, our refuge. 263. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide. A shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied. A shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm, a shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes of fright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms that may round us be, the shelter in the time of storm. We'll never leave our safe retreat, the shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. O rock divine, O refuge dear, The shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever dear, The shelter in the time of storm. O Jesus is the rock in a weary a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. What a blessed consolation. Let's take our Bibles and look one more time to the prophet Habakkuk. He started a few weeks ago by reading through this prophecy, this book, and uh, today we come to chapter 3. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Well, just back off from Matthew and go backwards and you'll find in Habakkuk chapter 3. Remember how chapter 1 began, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. That word burden means a weight, the weight of God's glory. What the Lord revealed unto him, how he would chasten the children of Israel, taking them into captivity by an idolatrous nation, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, and while he struggled with how God take an evil nation to punish the nation of Israel, yet we saw the Lord directed him just to stand and wait. And that's always a good thing. We don't understand perhaps God's dealings or his providence in our lives to wait on the Lord. And that's what we looked at last time in chapter 2. How the Lord would prove himself mighty 
not only in the destruction of the Babylonians eventually in his time, but in the complete preservation of that people of Israel. Why was it that God was preserving the nation of Israel? It was for one reason, because it had already been foretold and foreordained that Christ should come from that nation, particularly the tribe of Judah. And that's the tribe here, really, that was in question because years earlier, 100 years earlier, God had already raised up the Assyrians to come down and take the 10 tribes of Israel away in captivity, never to be reestablished again in the land. And then there was Judah that followed in that idolatrous path, and so the Lord took them into captivity by the Babylonians. You say, well, was Judah any better than the other ten? No. But God's promise was that there would be a seed come through that tribe of Judah, of the seed of David. And we can say then, conclusively, that it was for Christ's sake that that nation was not completely destroyed because Christ would come from that nation. And so we see here this beginning in verses 1 and 2, a prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet of Shiganoth. Here we see the prayer here actually is in the sense of praise. And what we have here is somewhat of a hymn of Habakkuk out of devotion to the Lord, how that the Lord would revive his work among that people in the midst of all these years of adversity. And so he says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech. I have heard thy word. That's where our comfort derives. It's in hearing the word of the Lord. What saith the Lord? And Habakkuk here, in spite of his complaints, was brought to see that the Lord is just. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Is what he told Abraham. And he says, and was afraid. This is in a good sense. Fear of not only understanding how God works through his providence and his sovereignty, but fear in this sense too. And I don't believe it just means reverence for God, but the true fear that if God should leave any one of us to ourselves, such would be our end. We would be destroyed with the rest of them. And so he says, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. There's a beautiful picture of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ because there are those that God has ordained to wrath and they have no mediator. And yet here his plea is that in his wrath, while he's pouring that wrath out on others, Remember mercy. Remember the mercy seat. Remember there where that blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat once a year. And that, that mercy represents the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ in whom we flee for refuge. And we cannot say any one of us that if God does show mercy, that it's by our merit, no. But here he's saying, he's not saying remember our merit, he's saying remember thy mercy. And that's how it is that any are spared, it's by the mercy of God. So now, the major portion of this chapter, verses three through 15, it says God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. Here, now, Habakkuk is reflecting back on different times that the Lord had spared the children of Israel in a mighty and influential way in past battles, whenever they came out of Egypt, whenever the Lord was pleased to deliver his people from their various captivities. And so this is what comes to mind now, even as he thinks forward to the deliverance that 
the Lord is showing him that he will do on behalf of these in his day. He speaks there of his glory covering the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Whenever, think about the praise when the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And they passed over that Red Sea, that song of Moses, song of deliverance. All of this is what Habakkuk is reflecting upon. And his brightness was as the light, it said. He had horns coming out of his hand and there was the hiding of his power. And before him went the pestilence and burning coals or burning diseases went forth at his feet. It's interesting here that it speaks of burning diseases. This is something that man has no control over. All the Lord has to do is send one virus and he can scatter whole nations, shut down whole nations, such as his power and glory to do so. He stood and measured the earth. He beheld and drove asunder the nations and the everlasting mountains were scattered. You know, it's always putting this in the past tense, were, were, were. Again, what, what God has shown in his faithfulness in the past, he's ever faithful in dealing with his people looking forward. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction, and the curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Again, whenever the Lord was casting out those enemies from Canaan, and uh, whenever God purposed to deliver Israel from Egypt, these are, these are what Habakkuk here is reflecting upon, and you can go back and read about these various places that he's citing here, but the point is that this same sovereign God who has acted in the past on behalf of his people will continue to act on behalf of those that he has from eternity purposed to save by his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter how desperate the situation may seem. And so it says there in verse 8, was the Lord displeased against the rivers? When God parted the waters, was he angry with the rivers? Was thine anger against the rivers? Was thy wrath against the sea that thou didst ride upon thine horses and thy chariots of salvation? Again, speaking of the deliverance of Israel, even as the as Pharaoh's army pursued, thy bow was made quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word. Again, it's showing us that everything that took place was according to God's word. Thou didst cleave the earth with rivers. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by, and deep uttered his voice, and lifted up his hands on high. You see, God is not only the God of creation, but the God of providence. And when you think about when God is pleased to to trouble the earth, he does it for his glory and honor. Think of a tsunami and the force and power behind that. Think of a volcano exploding where people live nearby and suddenly now the ash covers everything. Does this just, as people say, Mother Nature's mad? No, this is God's hand doing all these things. Sun and moon stood still in their habitation. Think about when Joshua was fighting the battle against the Amalekites and, and God caused the sun to stand still to give more daylight and thereby to win the battle. At the light of thine arrows they went and at the shining of thy glittering spear. It's speaking of all of these things that men look on in nature as being just the very armaments of God Himself. Described as arrows or the glittering spear. This is all God's power and handiwork being manifest. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. Talking about different times that the Lord graciously intervened and destroyed whole, whole armies of enemies against His people. Thou wentest forth, and this is a key verse here in verse 13, for the salvation of thy people. What is all this about? It's for the elect's sake. While the earth is troubled and 
and people flee and run and wonder what God is doing. He's doing all things, first of all, for His elect's sake, that is Christ. Christ was that first elect and all others that He chose in Him. And notice, even for salvation with thine anointed. If you look up that word in the Hebrew text, that's the word for Christ, the anointed one. So all of these things demonstrate God's purpose in everything that takes place in history in the world. It's not about us. It's not about this world. Remember again, he said it wasn't that God was angry with the river or anger with a particular land because he brings a famine. No, all of this is his power to condemn whom he will and save whom he will as the judge of the whole earth. And there's man's rebellion. They will not have this one to reign over them. That's who God has appointed to be the heir of all things. It's his blessed son. So all things are in his hands and appointed for his honor and glory. Thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by discovering the foundation under the neck. So it doesn't matter who it is. God can... Take out the head, it says, of, of a particular house of the wicked and discover the foundation on the neck. I'll tell you one he took out. That was Satan himself. And all of that posterity of Adam that did not have Christ as its representative ordained for destruction. And that's God's right to do so. Thou didst strike through with his staves, the head of his villages. They came out as a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was to devour the poor secretly. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great waters. He's talking about God directing even armies that even though there are heads over those armies, those heads command those armies only so long as God himself purposes. Doesn't matter how strong a commander, but when the day the day comes that God purposes that that nation or that army be destroyed, it cannot stand. And so, here, in verses 16 through 19, we find how Habakkuk then bows to God's will and all that's been revealed. Imagine him being all alone here, but the Lord teaching him. And revealing to him his word. He says, when I heard, my belly trembled. That's the true fear of God. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones. And I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. Now he's coming back to the reality of what awaits Israel. The time that he was writing this, this had not yet been fulfilled. Nebuchadnezzar had not yet entered down into the land to take out the tribe of Judah and Benjamin that remained. This would have occurred likely some 20 years after Habakkuk wrote this. But as he considers, and there's so many that read this scripture and just put it off as, as, oh well, that's history. But those that are the Lord's just like Habakkuk here, when he heard his belly tremble, there's a fear of the Lord that as we read these, and it says rottenness entered into my bones, it's the Lord by his word removing any hope in ourselves or hope in any circumstance. People, we can be just like those around us, resting in a false sense of security. We should never put any kind of hope in economics or peace and calm as if it's always going to be that way. It's only that way when the Lord purposes. But the Lord, you read history, read the scriptures, has turned whole nations upside down. And let's not be like the children of Israel when they heard these prophecies thinking, oh, well, no, it'll never happen. Not us. And they looked to that temple which was still in existence at that time, the one that Solomon had built. And they thought, no, God would never invade this nation and take that 
the temple down, but that's exactly what he did. And so even in our day, as we reflect upon whatever comforts or freedoms we might have, we don't take these things for granted. Right now, we have the privilege of being able to meet as we do and worship God according to his word, but that doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. It's only the Lord withholding or restraining an evil nation. And that's what our nation is. It's, it's just as corrupt as any other one. But if the Lord has preserved us to this point, it's because His purpose is being accomplished. And those of us that live at this particular time, we thank Him. It may not be that way within a generation. All of these privileges that we have may be taken away. And those that are the Lord's be chased into caves and caverns again, just like it was in the first century. So this is what Habakkuk was considering. But here is his response to all of that. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. And he's thinking of that time when Nebuchadnezzar would come down and ravage the land, and that's what they did. They just pillaged it, left nothing living by which any that were alive could find sustenance. But what does he say here in verse 18? Yet I will rejoice in the capital L-O-R-D. That's where our rejoicing is. Yes, there's affliction, there's fear and trembling, but the joy and triumph is in how the Lord keeps his own. I will joy, notice this, in the God of my salvation. That's where salvation is. It's in the holy God who has the purpose to save a people and preserve them for Christ's sake. And at this point, looking forward to the time when Christ would come and pay their sin debt and would uh, rise again and send on high victorious. That's where our joy is in the God of my salvation. And he says, the Lord is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet. Think of those mountain goats that they're amazing to watch. How on earth they can stand on those cliffs and run on them and not fall. But that's how he's describing what it is to be upheld by God himself. Make me to walk upon my high places, he says to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. So you can see how he began a prayer of Habakkuk. Verse 1 really is a song. And uh, certainly we can sing that today, knowing that God purposes all things, and he has his people that... He has saved through the work of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Anointed One, and that our deliverance is in Him. Gracious Father, thank You for Your Word. I want You here to ponder and consider. I pray that You would cause us to see even now how fearful it is for any one of us not to have Christ as our Savior, our Redeemer, a representative, and that if we do, even as Habakkuk said, in wrath, remember mercy. I'm thankful for Christ, who is that mercy seat, Christ the anointed one, and who has come and worked out that salvation to your satisfaction, that your law and justice have been satisfied on behalf of that people that you purpose to save, that nothing this world or nothing within us, even our own sin, could ever prohibit you from working your work of salvation on behalf of sinners such as we are. So we thank you, praise you, and ask, Lord, that you be pleased to meet with us and strengthen our souls at this time. And give you the praise, honor, and glory in our dear Savior's name. Let's take our hymn books one more time and we'll sing hymn number 176 176
break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. That's who Christ is, the bread of life. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. As thou didst break the loaves beside the sea, beyond the sacred page, I see thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. Bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me. As thou didst bless the bread by Galilee, then shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall. My peace, my all, in all. Thou art the bread of life, O Lord, to me. Thy holy word, the truth that saved me. to eat and live with thee above. Teach me to love thy truth, for thou art love. Oh, send thy spirit, Lord, now unto me. That he may touch my eyes and make me see. Show me the truth concealed within thy word. And in thy book revealed I see. The Lord. Let's take our Bibles and look again at 2 Kings chapter 11. And I've entitled this message, The Preservation or a Preserved Seed. Might be a better way to put it, a preserved seed. Remember the last time we were studying in 2 Kings chapter 10, the Lord had used Jehu, who was one of the kings of Israel, to go and to destroy every seed of Ahab, the evil king, and his sons. And it was quite an execution. There were 70 some that were slain. And that was the instruction that was given to go and slay them, everybody that was given to that worship of Baal. And then we read how in all of that, even Jehu himself, his heart was not turned to the Lord. While he went after and destroyed the temple of Baal in Samaria, yet he himself continued to hold to that false religion of worshiping the golden calf as far as Israel is concerned. And we saw how it's possible for people to go out and in the name of reformation, attack and destroy certain aspects of idolatry and yet they themselves are every bit as much a part of idolatry as those that they have destroyed. There are many religious organizations in our day that attack all that is false in their eyes, and many of them mix their religion with politics. They 
want to get legislation passed to, to put down this one or that one, and yet they themselves, the very thing that they hold to in their religion is just as idolatrous as those that they're attacking. And such was the case. And so with all of this killing and slaying of different ones that we find now in chapter 11, it says when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, that was one of the kings of Judah, that her son was dead. So Jehu not only executed judgment on those of Israel, the 10 tribes of the north that had been given to Baal worship, but also Ahaziah, who was one of the, the, the kings of Judah that was slain. And it says when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the, the seed royal. Now this seed royal that she was going after was all the seed of David that she sought now in revenge to destroy any that would be of David's descendants. When it says there the seed royal, she's talking about of the seed of David. And so we have to remember here, if you go back and someone asked me that said, how on earth do you keep all of this straight? I gotta keep going back and checking myself because it can seem confusing, but I will tell you this one chapter 11 here, by the time we're done with it, it'll be one you'll wanna come back to and just see beside all of the action that's going on, see how there is a purpose, God's purpose in all of this, to preserve alive a seed of David because it had been promised already to David that his seed would sit upon the throne. And really what we're reading here is a fulfillment of what God said all the way back in the garden, that the seed of the serpent would be at enmity with the seed of the woman. And even though Christ had not yet come, we're seeing this battle against even that seed of David that God had promised. And so when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, Ahaziah had been the king of Judah that had been executed by Jacob. That's back in 2 Kings 9, 27 through 29, if you want to go back there and read it sometime. But, so she used this occasion of her son's death to take power for herself. And she would reign over the land for six years. Now, Athaliah, that you see here, was actually the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. And she had been given to King Jehoram. So she would have been the wife of one of the kings of Judah. King Jehoram was the one just before Ahaziah. Ahaziah was Jehoram's son. And when you stop and think about this then, when she went to destroy, what we're gonna read about, she's actually killing her grandsons. Such was her enmity and hatred that not one should live because she desired to rule and reign. We're going to see that in a little bit. So not only was she a bad influence on both her husband, Jehoram, king of Judah, but also of her son who followed Jehoram, king Ahaziah. And when it says here, and destroyed all the seed royal, all the royal heirs, she was from the family of Ahab, and Jehu had completely destroyed all of Ahab's descendants. So she was thinking of defending the cause of her father and her mother in all of this. And so Athaliah tried to save something for her father's name. That's what this is all about, preserving some sort of dignity for her father's name and Ahab's family by trying to eliminate the house of David in Judah. And so we see here as she was going about and destroying all the seed royal, there was one here, verse two, by the name of Jehoshaphat, 
the daughter of King Joram. And notice, sister of Ahaziah. So these are all family members by marriage. And she took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons, which were slain. And they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, so that he was not slain. Now we're down to one heir, one seed, that had he been destroyed, there would have not been any more seed of David that would have existed. And so from a natural point of view, you read this and think, <clears throat> but in reality, God purposed to preserve this seed all along. Go back and think about how the Lord preserved Moses. When it was Pharaoh that was destroying all those children. Think about how the Lord preserved our Lord Jesus Christ as a child. When Herod sought to kill every child from two years of age and younger, and many were destroyed, but they could not lay a hand on the seed of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we find examples throughout Scripture here of how the Lord's going to preserve his honor and glory in his name. And think about what it would be to have a young child that would have to be hidden in a bedchamber from Athaliah in her household, in that place where these would have been right under her nose. Here again, having read in Habakkuk how God rules and ordains in all circumstances, here's an example. You would expect to hear a, a child making noise or something that would spark attention as to who is this child. And yet, according to God's purpose here in verse 3, it says that he was hidden with her, with this nurse, in the house of the Lord six years. So this would have been a special chamber there in the temple of the Lord, where there would have been all of the, the activity going around, and yet this child had not ever been revealed. He was the descendant of David. He was the successor of this royal line, now that all the others had been killed. And again, for David's sake, you say, well, why all of this? This is not just happenstance. For David's sake, God, remembering the promise that he had given to David, that he would raise up a seed to sit upon his throne, he preserved this one young survivor from the massacre of Athaliah and preserved it in a small boy. There again, you think about God's sovereignty, where his men purposed, like it says of Joseph there, you meant it for evil, God and for good, God purposed it for good. And here again, I'll refer you back to Josephus, an historian that is written on all of these portions and commented on them. Sometimes when I mention that, I had someone say to me, I didn't realize these are three volumes of, of Josephus and they're all small print. Yeah. But it's a chronicle written by a Jew of the history of the Jews that was not himself a believer as far as we know. And yet his purpose, God purpose that he write and comment as a historian on some of these very stories that we're reading here. And he says that this bedroom where the child and his nurse did was a room where spare furniture and mattresses were stored. So it would not have drawn attention. And imagine being a little boy, but it was in the house of the Lord. It was in the temple of the Lord where these priests that served at the altar lived. I can see a picture there of how this one preserve was preserved for Christ's sake, right there in the middle of that temple and those sacrifices and those priests that were there for 
the honor and glory of the Lord is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this for six years, it says, and Athaliah did reign over the land. Now in the seventh year, Jehoiada, Jehoiada was a man that was the Lord's and that his heart was toward the Lord and against the idolatry of the day. Jehoiada sent and fetched the rulers over hundreds with the captains and the guard and brought them to him unto the house of the Lord. This is key. All of this taking place in the house of the Lord. And that place that stood against all of the idolatry of the day. This shows us that even as wicked as things were under Athaliah's reign, yet God had his remnant. God had his people. God had his worship that these would indeed continue to worship him in truth, even though all others were apostate. And so he brought them into the house of the Lord and made a covenant with them. Here's a covenant. It's, it's an oath. And what was the oath? That they would worship the true God. And here's evidence that, that God was not dead. Even though all this other was going on, there's times when you look around, you wonder, where is God? David wrote about it there in Psalm 115. Wherefore did the heathen say, where is thy God? And he answered, our God is in the heavens, and he hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. So even in this, with the, the, the killing destruction, that's God. But the preservation of a people for Christ's sake, that's God. And so we see his sovereignty in this. And he took an oath of them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. Can you imagine their surprise? Probably disbelief at one point that they thought the whole seed of David had been destroyed. And yet here was this one that was preserved. And... You can imagine, put yourself in that moment, being one of these, that for six years they had believed that there wasn't any surviving heir of David's royal line, and therefore no legitimate ruler to displace Athaliah. I think, too, of the years between Malachi, the prophet, when the Lord prophesied through Malachi that he would, the Lord would send the messenger of the covenant. And then 400 years went by. And it seemed like that promise would never be fulfilled of the coming of the, the Messiah, of the Son of God, whose days are from, from old. And how few there would have been in Christ's day when he was born, Think about the message to the, the shepherds that the angels say. With the shepherds, that today in this city of David, a Savior is born. And then to the Magi, a couple years later, as they traveled and followed the star, found Mary Joseph and Joseph in the house, and they're looking upon this little baby, or young man at that point. It's probably two years after his, a lot of people think, well, they went to the main. No, it was two years. That's why Herod, when he found out about it from them, he killed every child two years and under. He calculated that time. And yet here was God's son that he had preserved. And then a, a great one is as he grew, they brought eight days, they brought the Lord as a baby to the temple to perform what the law required of a child, a male child that was born to be circumcised. And who did they encounter with Simeon? Can you imagine Simeon seeing that baby child? He told the Lord, I, I can die. My eyes have seen my salvation. And I assume that that would have been pretty much the case here in this moment as they pondered. But now to make sure that the secret was secure and that Athaliah finding out would not be able to destroy this one child, as you 
can imagine that would be the first thing she'd want to do. It says, and he commanded them, saying, This is the thing that ye shall do. The third part of you enter in on the Sabbath, shall even be keepers of the watch of the king's house. In other words, there on the Sabbath day, when the priests were coming in and out uh, anyway, changing shifts, there would be nothing spurious here to cause alarm on anybody's part. But now to insert in these group of priests coming in and out, be there to be the keepers of the watch of the king's house. This is God again moving men in positions and places to accomplish his purpose. And he said a third part shall be at the gate of Sir, and a third part at the gate behind the guard, so shall ye keep the watch of the house that it be not broken down. So all the while these priests were going in and out, accomplishing their duties as priests, and offering up the sacrifices, here would be these that are keeping an eye out, watching on behalf of this one child. And two parts of all you that go forth on the Sabbath, even they shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord about the king. And ye shall compass the king round about, every man with his weapons in his hand, and he that cometh within the ranges, let him be slain. And he, and be ye with the king as he goeth out and as he cometh in captains over the hundreds did according to all the things that Jehoiada the priest commanded and they took every man his men that were to come in on the Sabbath with them that should go out on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest See, that's who this Jehoiada was he was one of the priests therefore had that interest in the preservation of this seat of David and uh, would have been one that the Lord would have taught to see how vital it was that this seed be preserved. So it says, verse 10, to the captains over hundreds, did the priest give King David spears and shields? Now they're bringing out all of these that have been put in storage because they were no longer necessary. But now the Lord was reviving this kingdom and this seat of David and now come the, the spears and the shields that were in the temple of the Lord and the guards stood every man with his weapons in his hand round about the king from the right corner of the temple to the left corner of the temple along by the altar and the temple and he brought forth the king's son and put the crown upon him and gave the testimony and they made him king and anointed him. There's an interesting progression here, and were it that we could spend more time doing this, but we can see here just in how this king's son, this one who is preserved, was being, first of all, revealed. He brought out the king's son it says there in verse 12, he brought forth the king's son. That's, that's how Christ has come into this world, even as a child. And at, at an appointed time, brought forth in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, that he might redeem those that were under the law. So as I was studying this, I was seeing this particular progression, that this is how God does his work in bringing forth his son, that one promise from all eternity, and yet now being brought forth to be revealed. He was not to spend his lifetime in hiding, but to be revealed. It's like with our Lord Jesus Christ, for 30 some years, when he was on this earth, growing as a child, he was not revealed yet to the public. That's when John the Baptist announced that there was one coming after him who was before him. And preached, behold the Lamb. Christ was revealed at the age of 30 because that was the age when priests entered into the ministry. So there's a progression here. But not only revealed, but to know in his nose and first love, and put the crown upon him. 
So he was to be revealed and he was to be crowned. The view that most have of Jesus today is one of needing help, not a king. A lot of people believe, well, when he comes again, then he's going to be. He's ruling and reigning now. And he's received that crown of his father through the work that he accomplished here on this earth. That's where his glory has been established in his coming and living that perfect life and laying down his life on behalf of that people that the father gave him. And so he was to be crowned. This was the public official recognition of him as king, not just in name, because there were many that mocked him as king, but he was God's king. He said, I have set my king on my holy hill. People today are acting like he's running for an election and we need to vote him in and make him king. No, he's already been crowned king by his father. And those that are taught of Christ, they bow to him as king. And then again, it says here, and gave him the testimony. That's the word of God. They gave him, these were scrolls that would have been preserved there in the temple that were given to him. And that according to Deuteronomy 17, 18, if you look back there sometime, you can write it down for now. It says that the king should have his own copy of the scripture. And so by acknowledging him, and crowning him, now we see him being given that testimony to the very scriptures that really testifies to why he was preserved, that the, the promise of David, the seed that should come from David, all of this is summed up in this. So here we have now not only one who was to be revealed and to be crowned, but was to come with the very word of God or according to the word of God. And all of this according to God's purpose. And so it says they made him king. And they anointed him. All of this is a picture, really, of the Lord Jesus Christ. The anointed one. And those that receive him. So to make him king is, it says he came unto his own, his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. They don't receive him and then God gives them the power to know. Any that received him, it's because God gave them, gave them the power to believe on his name. And so we see these here all around this one that was the Lord's anointed, that they recognized so according to the promise of God that in the seed of David, he would raise up a king. And they didn't fear. This is what happens when the Lord teaches any. They don't fear the consequences. When these understood that, yes, this was one that had been preserved by God himself, there was no fear. They anointed him. And uh, that this anointing was according to God's purpose. And then it says they clapped their hands. Such was the joy. And said, God saved the king. Some say today the phrase, God long live the king. But this shows again how this one who represents the Lord Jesus Christ is to be received, and that is with all honor and praise and glory. And so it is today that any that the Lord teaches, that's how we receive him with joy. When the Spirit of God is pleased to teach the heart, and we bow to him as king. Now, when Athaliah, verse 13, heard the noise of the garden of the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord. She had no respect for that temple the whole time she was reigning. It seized power. But now, when she looked and there was the king, it says there in verse 14, the king stood by a pillar as the manor was, and the princes and the trumpeters by the king and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets, and Athaliah rent her clothes and cried, Treason, treason! There again, when left to yourself, you don't see your own 
You don't take the blame. You see anything that does not glorify you as being a threat. And certainly that was the case here. But Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds and the officers of the host and said unto them, Have her forth without the ranges, and him that followeth her kill with the sword. For the priest had said, Let her not be slain in the house of the Lord. Again, such was the respect here that anything that was contrary to God's glory be removed first and slain outside of that house that that blood not be shed there because the only blood to be shed was what God ordained at this time in that temple. That was to be those sacrifices that were offered, again, as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they laid hands on her and she went by the way by the which the horses came into the king's house, and there, there was she slain, right near where she had usurped her authority and had lived in what she thought some measure of peace and comfort, thinking that she had now got the upper hand. And it was right there that the Lord purposed that she should die. It's like the scriptures say, when all say peace and safety, then sudden destruction. And Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people. These are all important words when you see that word covenant in scripture. Because it has to do with an agreement. And here it is between the Lord, the king, and the people. Think of God's covenant with his son. Who, his king is his son. That covenant was made between the Lord and the king and his people. People are the beneficiaries of this covenant. Jehoiada himself representing the high priest by which God is merciful to his people. It says that they should be the Lord's people between the king also and the people of oneness. Think of the covenant. People talk about the covenant of grace that was purposed from all eternity, but accomplished when Christ came and fulfilled it. And the safety and security of that people with with whom God has made that covenant with his son, them as beneficiaries. That is their foundation. That's our salvation. And so all the people of the land went into the house of Baal. And here we see these being encouraged now because remember Jehu destroyed the house of Baal up in Samaria. Here there was a house of Baal right there in Jerusalem that Athaliah would have encouraged that Baal worship to continue because that's what her father did, worshiped Baal. And now the people are directed to go and to break it down. His altars and his images break they in pieces thoroughly and slew Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars, before the altars of Baal. Think back about Elijah. When they had built their altar and danced around it and cut themselves, when it was all said and done, Elijah took all of those prophets down by the river and slew them, shed their blood. God will not have any rivals. If you don't get anything outside of this other than that God has purposed to preserve that seed for his son's sake, but also he will not have any rivals. There's not going to be any compromise in how God is to be worshipped through his one son and all others destroyed. Priest appointed officers over the house of the Lord and he took the rulers over hundreds and captains and the guard and all the people of the land and they brought down the king from the house of the Lord and came by the way of the gate of the guard to the king's house and he sat on the throne of the kings. And all the people of the land rejoiced and the city was in quiet they slew Athaliah with the sword beside the king's house. Seven years old was Jehoash when he began to reign. That means he would have been a baby because she reigned for six years. This would have been the smallest of that seed that that nurse would have picked up and hidden. And now at seven years old, the Lord purposed that he should sit on that throne and reign. What a beautiful story that we find here, that what God has purposed, we know it shall be. And that's, 
That's really why we have confidence even in what we know of the gospel today. It's, it was promised in the Old Testament that this seed should come, and he did. And, and now, reading the New Testament, we see how it's all been fulfilled and that Christ is that one seated upon that throne being anointed of his Father. Let's take our hymn books and sing hymn number 226. 226. My Savior. I am not skilled to understand what God hath willed, what God hath planned. I only know that His right hand is one who is my Savior. I take Him at His word indeed. Christ died for sinners, this I read. For in my heart I find the need of Him to be my Savior. That He should leave His place on high and come for sinful man to die. You count it strange, so once did I, before I knew my Savior. And oh, that he fulfilled may see the travel of his soul in me, and with his work contented be, as I with my dear Savior. Yea, living, dying, let me bring my strength, my solace from this spring, that he who lives to be my king wants I to be my Savior. All right, well, for the next time, Lord willing.